So who do you resemble? Who do you look like? Whose image do you bear? Your father, your mother, maybe a maternal grandfather, maybe a maternal grandmother, maybe a great aunt. Who do you look like? I submit to you today that you most resemble God himself. You and I are made in the image of God. This message today is about and comes from a discussion of a single verse in the New Testament. And that verse, as you're turning over to it, is Luke chapter 20, verse 24. It's an interesting story that happens in the New Testament. I'd like to thank Paul and Bonnie for the music and the reference to it. Uh, I am a uh, Paul and uh, Bonnie have been longtime members of our congregation, and so uh, you can tell the the way in which, uh, of course, I don't know that you know this. Paul was uh, when he was in Colorado was a performance major in uh, accordion, so he uh, is is really good at it. And Randy really composed. They both composed the piece for the best of that. Uh, we'll call it the fiddler on the roof motif, right? Um, but uh, it is a beautiful Sabbath day to be with all of you. And why did I interlude? and make those things instead of what my point was at the beginning. Research today says that I have 14 seconds to get your attention. 14 seconds to tell you I'm going to talk about the image that you have with God. I don't have five minutes to give you an SPS. I have 14 seconds to have you decide whether you're going to really, really listen. And so that's why I did it that way. Read, read with me, if you would, in Luke chapter 20, verse 24. Well, we start here, actually, in verse 20. So they watched him and sent spies who pretended to be righteous. Now, this is a lot of power. Okay? I mean, you're really after somebody, okay? You know what I mean? It's like, okay, so, so somebody comes to church today, and they want to see, are we really Mary Matter? It's like, it's like having a plant, you know what I mean? Wow. I mean, there's a lot of malice here, okay? And that they might seize on his words in order to deliver him to the power and the authority of the governor. And then they asked him, saying, Teacher, we know that you say and teach rightly, and you do not show personal favoritism, but teach the way of God and truth. They had set this up. They have got, I mean, this is better than one of those gotcha moments on 60 Minutes, Okay. Of course, the young people don't know what I'm talking about when I say 60 minutes. So anyway, I forget that. Okay. Uh, but look at it. It says here, and then they asked him, you don't show personal favoritism, verse 22. They said, is it lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But he perceived their craftiness, and he said to them, why do you test me? He looked at Daenerys. Whose image and inscriptions on it? And they answered, and they said, Caesar. And he said to them, Render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. Today we want to talk about the things that are God's. We want to talk about that your destiny and my destiny comes from knowing whose image we bear, and thus the fact that we can be transformed, we can be related, we can offer a future that is unique. What does it really mean to render to God the things that are God's? What is he talking about? We have to, an interesting dilemma today. In the world in which you and I live, image is something that is chosen. It is not implanted. It is not impressed. People are choosing whether they want to look like a male, whether they want to look like a female. My friends, the image we bear comes from God himself. This is an important and incredible thing. So today I want us to have an, an understanding that we must have an accurate expression of reflecting the image that God has put in us so that we can thus render to God all that is his. We're going to first talk a little background about this verse that I think you'll find interesting. We're then going to talk about the concept of image. We're then going to contact, 
talk about likeness, and then we're going to talk about the final focus on that are gods. Our lives, my premise, my, need to become an accurate expression of what the real creator intended for you and I to be. So look, as we talk about the background of this verse, there's a lovely couple pages out of uh, N.T. Wright's Simply Jesus. Laurel mentioned it one night, uh, we were talking about something, and it, it's just a fascinating understanding and impression. And Mr. Wright brings up this point, and he says here, with respect to uh, Caesar's image being on this coin in the, in the first century, around 30 AD, okay? He says, remember something. Rome had had tyrants for many centuries. Julius Caesar comes on the scene and changed all that. He, the, you know, he thus did the unthinkable. Caesar brought his army right back to, into Rome. Never had been done before. And this brought his power and prestige back. But the people, the power struggles in Rome would not permit it, right? And they assassinated Caesar. But, and then follows a bloody civil war. But there was one winner to emerge, and that was Caesar, Julius Caesar, Caesar's adopted son, Octavius. So upon taking the title of Caesar, he also takes the title Augustus, to be august, to be grand, to be great, right? So it means literally worthy of honor. So in the backdrop to this verse, who's worthy of honor? Whose image? Okay. Now, we must understand that now, at this point, Augustus declares his father, Julius, divine, that he was actually divine. So now Augustus, Octavian, Caesar, becomes officially the son of God. He becomes the divine Julius. This is the background. The first century AD, 30 AD, you ask anybody in the empire, okay? You ask anybody from Germany to Egypt, Spain to Syria, who is the son of God? And the politically correct answer was none other than Augustus Octavian, Caesar. Wow. In a world where mainstream religion was emphatically a branch of the state, Augustus, Mr. Wright writes, took the senior priestly roles as well. He became Pontific Maximus, meaning chief priest in the Latin. Augustus's court poets and historians now went into propaganda mode, okay? And they told about Rome's a thousand year story of history. And they created this new narrative that comes the son of Julius, the divine, the son of God, began a new golden age with the birth of this new child, a place of peace and prosperity that would now spread across the world. Sound interesting? The same themes of the Bible? So look, Earth and many poems, for example, the poem Virgil writes about Augustus. And it, it says, the earth, the sea, and the heavens will rejoice at the child now to be born. Well, this is what we find out of, the, out of Isaiah, right? Unto us a son is born, unto us a son is given. This is the, this is the false, the fake is present in front of Christ. This message was so potent that it is carved on stone monuments and inscriptions. It reads, good news, we have an emperor. Justice, peace, security, and prosperity are now here, ours forever. The Son of God has become the king of the world. So Augustus rules the Roman world, an increasingly massive empire. But he dies in 14, okay? And after his death, he too was di divinized, and his successor is Tiberius. Tiberius took the same titles. And so thus, we find on the coin that they give Christ the denarii, 
when he asks for a coin, not just any image is on the coin, it is that of Tiberius, the son of the divine, the divine son of Julius. And the coin says on it, Augustus, T. Caesar, D. V. O. F. It's short for Augustus, Tiberius, Caesar, divine Augustus. And so when they asked Jesus on that day whether they should pay a tribute to Caesar, the son of God, the chief priest, Jesus was in the eye of a storm, and his answer is important. He says, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, but render unto God that which is God's. This is the background of this verse. McLaren's Expositions on the Bible makes a few interesting comments about this. They said, you know, we already talked about the protagonists here, the antagonists. It's not, it's not unusual for antagonists to get together, but they decide to get together here and crush a third person. As I mentioned, the representatives of the narrow conservative Jewish groups, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, even the Herodians, all want this usurper gone. They would have answered this specific question in two different ways. One group would have said it is lawful to give tribute to Caesar, even Jews of the day, and that is the other group would have said it is not lawful to give this tribute to Caesar. But in this story, I love this line. McLaren says this, but it is no small matter when malice prompts. Like, hey, we're enemies, we got different answers, but let's entrap the guy together and it's okay. Wow. Okay, they calculate. If he says, no, we will denounce him to Pilate as a rebel. If he says, yes, we will go to the people and say, here is your pretty Messiah. He has no objection to a foreign yoke. Either way, he's toast and we win. But McLaren makes a statement here, sir. Says Jesus serenely walks through the cobwebs and lays his hand upon the fact. Now, I like that point. Sometimes we need to just be calm enough to walk through the cobwebs and grab a hold of the facts. Jesus recognizes this. He says, Let me see a silver penny. And they give it to him. He's, he knows, by the way, it happens to be the mount of tribute. And in verse 24, what's he say? Show me a denarius. Jesus had grown up. He knew exactly whose image was on it. But he wanted the coin. He wanted the facts in front of them. He wanted them to be able to know that he flipped it over. And on one side is the high priest. And the other side is the son of the divine. Him being the son of all the God of creation, the one who imprints an image, not on a coin, but on life for generations to generations, for decades, for millennia. You and I and all the progeny that come before, rep we represent an image too, an image that is much greater than that of a coin. So McLaren's goes on to say, to shape to um, the currency of the country proclaims the monarch of the country. To stamp his image on the coin is an act of sovereignty. I have the right to put my image on this coin and to make you look at it every time you buy a cup of coffee, right? Caesar's head declares that you are Caesar's subjects, whether you like it or not. It's too late to ask questions about tribute when you pay your bills with his money. How true. Thus, Jesus says, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's. But what about the other point? To render God the things that are God? Does not the parallelism require that we should suppose that the destiny of things to be devoted to God is stamped equally upon them? 
whatever they are, at least as plainly as the right of Caesar to exact tribute was inferred from the fact that it was his money, it was his currency, it was his country, the thought widens out in many, many directions that you could take this. But I want to confine us to one special line of contemplation. Whose image is on your life? Whose image is on my life? The answer to that, the conclusion is irresistible. About the penny with the image of Tiberius, the answer is no less plain to you and I, nor the conclusions less irresistible. When we turn the interrogation within and we look into our own being and we see ourselves, whose image, whose inscription, whose imprint do we see? With that background, I would like to now talk about the concept of image and likeness. And then we'll move on to rendering to God the things that are God's. Image, there's a lot to say about image but I'm only going to be able to talk to a couple of verses on purpose. If you'll turn with me to Genesis chapter 1, the quintessential scripture. You all have concordances on your phones. You can look up image. You can look at likeness. My job, my focus is to help you find the quintessential scripture that brings forward to you and me the import of image. In Genesis chapter 1, Verse 26, you know it by heart, do you not? It says, then God said, let us make man in our image. Think about the coin and the image of Caesar. And God begins when J Moses writes down the history for Israel and says, remember in the beginning, God our image. God didn't say, uh, sketch this out, angel, sketch this out, Christ, and we'll use, uh, we'll use uh, this image. God says, our image. Because what? He's the sovereign. He owns the time. He owns the matter. God chooses whose image he wants on what? Life. You and I. It says, according to... Our likeness, our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Interesting. Nope. Over a couple pages in Genesis chapter 9, verse 6. Chapter 9, verse 6. Notice this concept that is married with something else. This concept is of justice. 9, verse 6. Breaking into this, it says, Whoever sheds man's blood, by his blood shall be shed. By man, his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God, he made man. And as for you, be fruitful and multiply and bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply in it. My friends, when we're talking about shedding blood, God says it's a life with image, my imprint on it. That carries some weight. When the Pharisees, Sadducees, right, and the Herodians and the scribes all want to trick Christ, they're trying to trick him about what? About whose image is on a coin. When he says, you don't render unto the things that are God's, you have not used your potential life to have my image the image of the creator on you, in your, in your heart, in your mind, in your soul. You have hated, you've had contempt. Wow. That's what this verse brings up. Notice over there in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. 
we know this verse too. It says, whose mind the God of this age has blinded. Remember verse 3? But even our gospel is veiled. It is veiled to those who are perishing in the physical world. Whose mind the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. In 30 AD, those folks did not get it. The one who had been with God was there to shine light on their lives and remind them that they were made in God's image and they didn't see it. You and I have been given the privilege, if we know that God exists, if we see and we acknowledge his presence and power in life, we recognize that he has granted us the privilege to see that we represent him in his very image. The image that is stamped upon a man thus instills a con consequent obligation if we know these things. McLaren makes another comment. We can very often tell, a, tell what a thing is by noticing its make. For if you're one of those people that uh, dig up bones, right? Okay, and they call them animus. And you look up a bone and you say, oh, well, you know, some people say, well, that's a femur bone. It came from a Rexosanosaurus or something. You know what I mean? Well, they do these things. Well, that's true. It has a simile. They understand these things. So that bone was made for that animal. So plainly should the imprint of God be stamped on our lives that our God, our Lord, is in the truest sense a reflected in our image. The fact also means that if we are obligated to represent God correctly, then also we have a challenge. What happens with the fact that man sins? The whole glory and the splendor of the divine image in which we are made is now marred. It is now defaced. And McLaren makes this point. But there still remains such solemn, blessed, and awful resemblances between man and God that there can be no mistake as to which beings in the universe belong to God. Nor could there be any misunderstanding as to who it is our likeness is formed after. For we alone look like God. We don't look like a horse. We don't look like an animal. We don't look those ways. This is incredible. Now, you know, the, the German commentary, uh, Kiel and Diltz, makes the comment that really image and likeness are synonyms for the same thing. And they, there's a number of commentaries that want to spend a lot of energy. And it's a very interesting read talking about image and the things that you can imply from image and likeness and the things that you can apply for likeness. And I read them all, but I think these folks who are um, Germans in very precise field, look, the language is pretty much saying a synonym of the same thing. But if we look at likeness, just a moment, we can see a few attributes that I think are worth pulling out of Scripture as we zero in on this concept. Both we are made in the image and in the likeness of God. If we go back to verse 26, as I just mentioned, it says, We shall have dominion over the fish, the sea, the birds, and the cattle, and every creeping thing. Why? Because God has dominion over them. Because we don't aren't like them. We were made in the image of the Creator, the horse, and the giraffe and the elephant and the rhino were not made. They were creations of gods, magnificent creations, right? You know, butterflies and birds and little bugs that are on stuff when we look through microscopes, right? Are all God's incredible design, all with purposes. 
but you and I have a much different purpose, a much different design. Matthew Poole's commentary makes the comment. It says, the height of a man's stature, which is set towards heaven, when other creatures by their downward looks show the meanness of their nature. Think about it, right? The way a horse looks down, the way cattle look down, all of them, you know, the, the, the snakes that slither on the ground. We represent the uprightness. We are made to look up to a creator who made us in his image and likeness. You know, Genesis chapter 5, verse 1, in Genesis chapter 5, verse 1, we see this likeness. So if you think that it is only a metaphor, only a metaphor, think about this. They use the same Hebrew words here in verses 1 and 3. This is the book of the genealogy of Adam in Genesis 5. In the day that God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. He created male and female. He blessed them and called them mankind in the day they were created. And Adam lived 130 years and begot a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. Likeness. God made us in his image and his likeness just as we beget children. You know, there's a lovely scripture in Psalm 17, Psalm 17, that uses this concept of likeness. Psalm 17 and verse 15. Seventeen, verse fifteen. It's the end of this section. It's uh, talking about David has this prayer, and it's talking about salvation. And he, in verses thirteen and fourteen, he he confronts the cast down. And notice how he, he breaking into verse fourteen. With your hand, with your hand from men, O God, from men of the world who have their portion in this life, whose belly you will fill with your hidden treasure. They are satisfied with children and leave the rest of their possessions for their babies. As for me, I will see your face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I open with your likeness. David captures this. When we come from the grave, when we see God, we will see him in his likeness. We will see God because he made us in his image another reference that I won't read, but it's Isaiah 40, verse 18, talking about, to whom will you liken God, or what likeness will you compare him to, in Isaiah 40, verse 18. But look, there is another concept that I found in one of the commentaries, and I thought this was in, uh, worth pausing on, and it makes this comment that, look, is there any being on earth that can say to itself, I am? Remember Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, Moses turns aside and he says, who are you? And he says, I am that I am, God says. You and I, no man who's ever lived, no matter whether you're Julius Caesar, Augustus Octavian Caesar, who you want to pretend you're divine, who's in the grave, none of us can say, I am that I am. We alone, if we opt, adopt this point of view, we must recognize something. We will never be complete unless we can look up and say, you are true. You are God. And only then can we realize that he is the I am. And thus, when we granted the belief that God is God, and we say, thou art, then we can lay our hand in God's hand, and say, we are. McLaren makes this point in their commentary. It's an incredible thing, because what's it say in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27? Remarkable words, verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. 
So neither is there woman without man, nor man without woman, because in God's eyes and image, mankind, men and women, are one with him when mankind realizes that we are made in his image. Here I must pause. Here is where our society is at a great crossroads. You cannot understand the richness I purport and offer to you of a God who made us in his image if you think you get to choose your gender. We are on a collision course, my friends. People's Im image of God will be diminished if they can't realize the I am made us. And we look up and say, thou art. And when we say that, we become one with God, just as man and woman become one. We become one with God. God will not be mocked. This is a social experiment that has a very bad ending. When people do not recognize, thou art God, and we be but man made in his image. So we've laid the background for this, the coin, I thought it was incredible. We've discussed the obligation that having the image of God implies, and the awareness that understanding what a true likeness should draw us to. And now let us deal with the phrase, render to God the things that are God's. I would submit there are two implications here. You could find others. One, don't render to others what is God. And two, there is a restoration possible of a tarnished image that happens in life. The first point is don't spend your coinage, your life on the wrong things. Notice with me, 2 Timothy chapter 2. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, It is a lovely day out here. Second Timothy chapter two. Second Timothy chapter two and in verse 20 says, but in a great house there are, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work, a vessel of honor. The emperor's head was on that coin as a token of sovereignty, and it carried with it that obligation to pay the tribute. My friends, every fiber of our being protests against us using our nature for that which God did not intend. We all remember the story, do we not? In Daniel chapter 5, verse 23, and Belshazzar calls for the vessels of God to come to the big party, and they decide to use the vessels that brought from the temple to have they're big, big, we're going to call it a party, must have been perhaps more than a party. The verse says this, Daniel chapter 5, verse 23, you have praised the gods of silver and gold, bronze and iron, wood and stone, which do not see, which do not hear, which do not know, that the God who holds your breath in his hand and owns all your ways you have not glorified. Whoa. That's what God thought when they didn't recognize the import of the image and the likeness that had been imported to their lives. And this is what happens to some souls in life that consecrate their life for things that God did not intend offering them to false gods in whose their service is not blessed. Brethren, we only need to render to that which is God, which is God's, which is what? Our hearts and minds, ourselves. 
and then we will have sure repose. Our created, God created male and female as a symbol of God creating man in his image and likeness. So we must render to God, which is God, which is our heart, our mind, and our soul. And the second point is, under rendering to God the things that are God's, we must realize that it is possible to restore a defaced image. This happens in the physical life. There are a number of verses, and we will read more about those in this incredible Holy Day season about the life of Christ, what it means for his sacrifice, how a life is restored, a physical life, to see its potential, how its conscience is cleansed. These are the great and rich blessings of the spring Holy Days. I offer a few scriptures with reflect on the concept of rendering to God the things that are God's in light of an image, in light of a likeness. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15, it says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. God not only made us in his image, he God, the Word, became flesh and dwelt among us to lead the way. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. Jesus, who being the brightness of his glory, and the, get this, the express image of his person, and upholding all things by his word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of his, the majesty on high. Jesus blazed a trail to God, who is the source of our image. We must be encouraged that no defacement is possible among men, which God cannot restore. I think we hold that out from the pages of the Bible. Man must just remember that God is I am, when we recognize that he is thou art, we then become filled with the image, the likeness of God, and can do and watch a change and a transformation occur. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. This is a, a great verse because it brings together all these concepts of Image, likeness, rendering to God the things that are God's. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, he says, But we all, with an unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of God, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Be transformed is literally the Greek word metamorpho. Metamorpho is what? A caterpillar becomes a butterfly. Mankind made in God's image physically become what? A spirit life to dwell with God forever. It is possible. These same things, it says, age to age, glory to glory, we are in the same image as by the Spirit. What an incredible thing. Over, you know, section we always go to at a different time of year, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 49, it says, breaking into the resurrection chapter, it says, verse 49, 1 Corinthians 15, and we, as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we also shall bear the image of the heavenly man. Our destiny is not this earth. Our destiny is not time our destiny is with God without time, made in his image. Philippians chapter 3, verse 21, it says, God, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed, a different Greek word, sima, morphos, which means to fashion into the likeness, to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things. This is a season coming up of full and complete restoration of misused human images. 
we're the opportunity of turning and rendering to God all that is, is his, you and me. Today, we've talked about the background of what Jesus saw in that coin and how he made the point to them that there was an image and with that image goes an implied obligation to represent him. And as a likeness, that there is thus an awareness that by drawing close to God, we become all that he expects us to be. And then we then can render to God the things that are God's, our lives. Becoming an accurate expression of the real creator's purpose, whose image and likeness we bear. Wow. Therefore, our fellowship, our lowly trust, our order of love, by submissiveness, submiss submissiveness of obedience, by continuing of contemplation, by the sacrifice of self, McLaren's writes, we must yield ourselves to God in his, whose image we are fashioned. Is it any wonder when Christ looked at 25 and said, and he said to them, Render, therefore, to Caesars the things that are Caesars. But you, we need to remember that you must render to God all that is God's because he is the sovereign. You and I are made in the image of nothing less than the great creator God. 